Thank you so much for joining us for part two of how does software work for contractors? This is a special series that we've put together over here, eSub Construction Software with Hugh C. So I'll do a couple introductions real quick so everybody knows who is on the call with us. And then we will get started talking about some content. So my name is Rob McKinney, and I am the Director of Business Development for eSub Construction Software. I'm also the host of the Power to the Trades podcast. And I'm what we like to refer to as a construction technologist. That means I came out of the construction industry. I was a safety director, got really interested in technology and made the jump over uh, in 2013. So if you're curious to follow my work, you can check out my site at conapguru.com or follow me on social media at conapguru. And then the next person we have is the featured guest today, Hugh Seaton, who has authored a book. He has a podcast himself. He's been around the space for quite a while and has seen a lot of different things. And the, uh, the whole series that we're going through here is about his book, The Construction Technology Handbook. Hugh, how are you doing today, sir? Doing well, doing well. Appreciate you uh, joining us today to spread the good word about technology. Would you like to do a short introduction to uh, better explain your background and what you know about construction technology in this space? Sure. So I've actually been in technology as a kind of big word for about almost 30 years. I can't believe I just said that out loud. Um, <clears throat> the last 10, 10, 11 of which have been across AEC with a concentration in construction. So I've, you know, created my own um, construction software. It was actually an, an, an AI voice product, um, as well as, you know, done a bunch of things with VR and AR. Along the way, decided to write this book because I thought, you know, one of the things that's been a, a constant issue in all technology is getting people to adopt new ideas and sort of change what they're doing in a way that's useful as opposed to, you know, knee jerk or, or, you know, or not. So I thought, you know, it'd be a good idea is to write a book that level sets that talks about what technology is from the ground up. So, you know, people who, who are incredibly good at what they do, but may, may not know what an API is, don't feel like they're the dumb guy in the room when the reality is they know the hard stuff. So the book was meant to be a level setter and, uh, and hopefully we're, we'll, you know, get along there. And the rest of what I do kind of does the same thing. It's how are we demystifying? How are we sharing some information? Podcasts like this are, are also part of the same kind of idea, which is the more we're talking to each other and sharing ideas, the faster we're going to process this big problem of digital transformation and make it work for everybody. It is a fascinating journey, honestly. When you think about construction technology, and I always talk about this in presentations and lots of seminars of we have been building for thousands of years. I mean, arguably since the, you know, beginning of civilization, we have built lots of things. Humanity knows how to build. There's no doubt about that. But this technology thing, right? I mean, I started and I still feel like I'm a baby. I've been in this space since 2001. So going on 20 years. And in 2001, construction technology was in the office. We had computers. We used software, but the field was all paper. I remember the first superintendent that got a laptop in 2001 on a power plant. He didn't know what to do with the thing. He was a brilliant carpenter. He was a seasoned superintendent with 20 years experience at that time. But this, this Dell thing that was handed to him from the office that worked on, and let's think back, right, 2001. How well do you think his dial-up internet connection in the middle of nowhere on the border of Georgia and Alabama worked back in 2001? And I'll bet you that, I'll bet you the, um, What's it called? The modem sound was just perfectly welcome. I'm sure everybody oh, was hearing that squealing. It was hilarious, but we've come a long way. So, man, thank you so much for writing the book, the work that you're doing with your podcast and all the other uh, endeavors that you have to really spread the good word. So here is a screenshot. If you want to check out the book, uh, you can buy a hard copy. You can also do like I did. I got it. I'll be honest on my Kindle because I can carry it with me and read it everywhere. Very fascinating information. So you can dive in and really read you know, an easy consumption type material of what he was talking about, of, you know, what is an API? What is software? How do you define data? It gives you a lot of good information. And what we've tried to do in this series is boil this information down and give you kind of uh, some pointers, some tips of how to look at it. So we talked about this in the first part is really level setting for the, the time that we have to talk. It's Let's talk about the state of the industry in 2021. We have just gone through some pretty interesting times. You know, it's the first time I think globally we've had, you know, we hit the reset button and we paused, right? COVID's had an effect on our industry. It's still having an effect on our industry, our lives without a doubt. 
But, you know, Hugh, I'm curious to hear your thoughts. That's topic number two. You hear about less work. Certain markets, without a doubt, I, we saw shut down, you know, from the Northeast and Boston to Seattle. Different parts of the country have been shut down. Different sectors have shut down. But at this point, I'm hearing, I'm hearing a lot more positive thoughts than I did six, seven months ago. Are, are you hearing that there's less work across the country or more work currently? I'm hearing a lot of restarts. I'm, I'm hearing a lot of, of, of new, new things. Pe things have gotten a little unstuck um, mm -hmm. in, of, of people, you know, wanting to start things up. Um, and, you know, on the technology side, you, you've seen people get more comfortable with, um, you know, using technology to overcome some of the, some of the challenges, even while we're still doing, or at least waving a flag at, 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 uh, at mask wearing and, and uh, social distancing. Right. I think I think you got like the reality is you could argue that the industry was less impacted than I would have expected. If you'd asked somebody in 2019 and said the following things are going to happen, what do you think is going to happen? And most people would have said, "Oh my God, it's going to grind to a halt." And for a couple of weeks it did, but it was remarkable how across the the you know the the, the, the company the country how many places were able to figure it out kind of quickly. I mean, it was painful as hell and you don't know what's going on. And, you know, so those couple of weeks to a couple of months was really tough. Um, but but it was, it's really amazing how, how many places barely had an impact or had, a, had an impact that was pretty quick to, to come back. Very true, very true. Now we've also seen, you know, the continuing labor shortage and I don't think that's going away anytime soon. I mean, it's just a sheer matter of numbers, right? You have a very large workforce that arguably is fairly top heavy. And by that, I mean, when we're talking about the majority of workers, the average age of a construction worker is uh, not 20, shall we say. So the boomers seem to be aging out and they're not being replenished, but the industry, you do see a lot of positive things from different trade associations, from the unions, from the contractors trying to reach out, uh, of bringing new bodies in and even the supply chain, things have been disrupted, but uh, you know, just want to kind of set that level of we're getting there and we're, we're moving on. Now we got a comment Hugh that came in for somebody. Uh, this is, this is an interesting comment on the technology side. Con the construction industry is still slow to adopt digitization, but what do you think about the future of BIM? Especially now there have been a lot of talks about 5d, 6d, 3d. Now Hugh, I'll, I'll say this. I am hearing more and more interest in BIM workflows. And let's, let's right now, let's just keep it at 3D because arguably 2D, and by 2D, I'm talking about regular plans, a PDF that you put in a plan sharing system du jour and share that out to the team. That now is just kind of getting to the standard place of, man, when I found Plan Grid in 2013, people looked at me like I was crazy wanting $19.99 a month to store 500 plans in the cloud, even though I had all the benefits, the ROI, the reasons. 20, you know, get, I'm sorry, uh, from 2013 to now, so seven years later, I hate to say it, I, I haven't seen the same mass level of adoption at the 3D, but I think that really goes back to the fundamental issue of distributing a 2D plan is taking someone else's work, making a PDF and sharing it. Distributing a 3D model, and let's just keep it at 3D for now, what are your thoughts on when is that inflection point for 3D going to go up to where it's more commonplace that I think we could actually have common discussions about 5D, 6D, and 7D? Yeah, it's funny. There's a bunch of pieces that, that all come together. When, when, it, when you talk about adoption of the technology like, like BIM, um, I think there's a, it, it's not, it, everybody was hoping it would happen faster than it did. And I think the reason why it didn't is because it's, it just is really hard to, to use, like you don't, it isn't like, okay, I'm gonna go use BIM and then, you know, four or five hours of, of experience later. Right. That's problem number one, is to get an installed base of people who can really work in it, took mm -hmm. a long time. I mean, now you have to your point about some of the, the uh, trade unions and so on, that, you know, like the UA in Chicago, I know through Mike Zvanovic, they've been teaching Revit for years now. And that, that means that there's more and more of an installed base of people who can productively use it. So one of the problems that just gets ignored a lot, I think, is that you need a, a lot of people that can productively use it, both on the generating side, then on the you know, coordination side, on the understanding side. I mean, it's, just, it's more than one person 
you know, making something and, and then that's it. The other mm -hmm. thing that, that is, so I think you're seeing an, an, an installed base of, of, and the reality is it needed to be, probably needed to be one product. So the fact that it's Revit <laughs> is what it is. I mean, certainly for commercial, right? But once right. you figured out Revit and you think like that and you're kind of good at, at the, the menus and all that, you know, it probably isn't an enormous lift to go learn um, Bentley or something. If, if, but I just don't, I don't think you're going to see that a ton. But, but anyway, the, the second thing, Rob, that is that, that, you know, how many contracts right now are still 2D? Like mm -hmm. you're responsible for delivering to a 2D. That's just a, a really big issue is, mm -hmm. is at the end of the day, you know, you, you know, you, you have to worry about, all right, I'm producing this in, in 3D and it captures all the nuance of, of 3D shapes. But damn it, I've got to, I've got to, this has to be produced to and, and against a 2D drawing. How are we doing that? So I think that's a problem. And I'm, I'm you know, my understanding is in, in design build and, and IPD, you, you're a little bit less of an issue. Mm -hmm. uh, but for the moment, I think that's huge. And they split it was, it's, I've heard 70% of, of jobs are design bid build. Someone else said North America, and obviously they were including Canada there. I forgot where it came from. That somebody was somebody was citing a uh, an a projection that that in 2021, 50 percent of projects will be design build. Huh. I I, uh, I, don't, I, don't, I didn't see that source, so I'm just saying that that I could see it moving in that direction. It's it's a right. lot of it's a lot of first time folks making you know five story little buildings that maybe don't want to go through all that um, upfront. True. So anyway, the point is, I think until you figured the 3D out. Integrating other information, like mm -hmm. make it into quote unquote 2D, 5D, 17D, whatever it is, it, it doesn't matter unless you've got the model as as the kind of center of the workflow and not the precursor to the real workflow. If that makes sense, it does. Uh, we have a follow up comment to that. Uh, do you think that technology such as BIM will completely overtake old school 2D, especially in smaller venues where BIM isn't so readily accepted? And I would have to wager, yes, uh, to Hugh's point, it's a matter of getting the trained workforce there for that tool. Because if you think about adopting 2D, it was just saying, okay, instead of rolling up a set of plans and carrying yeah. them around and marking them up, you and put you them on a tablet. Some, and you learn to read some stuff. You know what I mean? Yeah. You, learn, you learn a couple of conventions. Yeah. And, yeah. What a big change. Getting the skilled workforce ready for 3D now that's a whole different ball game, but we got to think too with, we, we mentioned before in the labor shortage, if we have this whole new influx of younger workers who grew up with mobile devices, playing video games, they adopt to it a whole different way, but you have to have a balance. Uh, I see one of my friends was on here earlier, Saul from uh, uh, up north. He was a tradesman for nearly 20 plus years and came into the office and learned to do Revit and converted his career from a field career to an office career. Now, teaching someone the tools of Revit, he, let's think about this for a minute, teaching someone how to navigate the software is arguably not as difficult as trying to impart upon someone, uh, like Saul, for example, how do you teach someone 20 years of building in the, in, in the trades of being out in the field of knowing what pipe goes to what pipe and what order and what won't reach, reach around and understanding tolerances and all the variables? It's kind of a double-edged sword, right? We need new workers. They need to know how to design, but how do they learn how to build without ever going into the field? You know, because sitting in a little cubicle drawing all day is not the same as trying to hang pipe with lots of systems in the way, right? So it's funny, um, our, our common friend, uh, Josh Bone was talking once about how when he was uh, in a consulting gig a little while ago, 100% of the BIM models didn't leave enough room. Uh, they had to, they, the way he described it is every 100% of the models they had required that they lower the ceiling <laughs> every single time, because it's exactly what you're talking about, is that, that it, it's, in, and think the, pro, it's the difference between abstract and concrete, right? Is that like in abstract, right. there's plenty of room. I, you know, come on, you can kind of wiggle. <laughs> but then you get there and, you, and it's hot and you've got things in, and you need to maintain it and you know, all that. And that was, the, I think the bigger issue was ma maintaining, yeah. making something that's a functioning building, not something you could barely snap together. But well, I yeah, think- there's a difference in designing art yeah. and functional space. Yeah, just stuff that people that have 10 other things on their minds can, can reliably go do something with. And oh, yeah. the next thing. One quick thing I'd say, though, to, to Don's question about will 
will 2D be you know, completely replaced? Technologies tend not to really go away. They tend to become really the, um, a niche thing that you do for certain stuff. So I'll bet you in 50 years, 100 years, there's still flat, flat ways of looking at plans in a flat way because sometimes it's just easier to see that. Mm -hmm. Just like you know, radio never went away and paper never went away and telling stories never went away and fire never went away. I mean, that, that's just, it, it, it turns into a thing you use in special circumstances right. instead of the thing you do all the time. And I think you'll see that with, I don't know if it's going to be paper versus you know, LCD screens or whatever, but I think there's always going to be, especially when you want to have like a high level idea of what's where, sometimes 2D is just a lot simpler than seeing the complexity of a 3D representation. So I think you're still going to see 2D. It's just going to stop being the, the main way we do business. True. All right. Got another uh, point to talk about here on this slide. Do you think the labor shortage will cause for the industry to lean more towards prefab? Now, Hugh, I would wager yes. I think there's many reasons why you see lots of trades go into prefab. Uh, Safety improvement and quality have been two of the reasons I've really heard more than the labor shortage, but I think it, it factors in too. What are you hearing from different contractors currently? Well, not just contractors, but folks in, this, in the supply chain. And so those last two bullets, I think there's, a, there's some parts where they overlap. Um, and I'm, yeah, I think what's gonna wind up needing to be true is we're gonna need to, to be able to supplement high quality workers with, mm -hmm. with less trained workers that are maybe not going to make a career out of this, but might do it for five years or something like that. And that means that, that that's where, um, whether it's prefab offsite industrialized, depending on where you want to be on that, that kind of range, you can bring mm -hmm. in people that can be productive without knowing everything that's going on in the job site and not needing to be quite so worried about safety. And, and there's just it's a lot mm -hmm. of things you need to make sure someone understands on a real job site that you don't, it's like they need to understand not to be stupid and, you know, stick their tongue, like tongue in the socket, but, but yeah. the yeah. bar is a lot lower in, in, in certain kinds of, of, of manufacturing. And, and more to the point, I think the supply chain will wind up being where more and more production gets done. Um, and that's just, it allows you to get to not need everyone to be a, you know, 10 year veteran of the electrical trades to be able to be productive. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Well, let's talk a little bit now about software specifically. Oh, let me catch. We had one more comment real quick. Interesting comment. This is from uh, my friend uh, Sal. If you wouldn't trust the person to be your foreman in the field, you shouldn't trust them to be your detailer. Your detailer is supplying your foreman with the installed data today, just as the foreman provided data in the past. That is an interesting point you bring up of, which way the, let's say the tribal knowledge information flow is going back and forth. Uh, very interesting point. What are your thoughts, Hugh? Um, yeah, it's a great question. And I think it's gonna wind up needing to be some jobs um, are more, you know, are more standardized and you're, you're having to simplify them. I, I hear his point, mm -hmm. but it doesn't change the fact that you're, something has to give. You're, mm -hmm. you're either gonna have people that are unqualified because they're the best you could get in the current way we do things, or you're going to make it simpler. So you're, and what you do now, you put more people on the job and you give them less to do, or you have to supervise them or whatever. That's just not a, that's not a great long-term way of solving a problem. And, you know, if you look at the underlying demographics of the U S we're never going to have more people than we do right now at the age that joins the trades ever. There's, there's no, sure. there's no, there's no boomers coming. There's no millennials coming. None of that. Right now, the, the biggest number of people in, in the biggest kind of age group is 25 to 29. And right under that is, is the uh, 20, was it, how would they do it? 20 to 24, something like that. Mm -hmm. The point I'm making is it's never getting better. No matter how much we try and how much we go to high schools and tell the guidance counselors to stop being, you know, to stop, you know, saying bad things. It, it, and how much we invest in trade schools, we should do all of that. Of course we should, because no matter what, we're still going to want great people doing great work, but, but it's not going right. to be in the hundreds of thousands and, and even half million number that, that we need. If we're, at, we're at, if we're at something like 350 to 400,000 too few right now, it's not getting better. And if we're about to dump, uh, you know, what is it? 250 to 400 billion a year in this infrastructure bill. Mm. It's not going to be a two trillion all of a sudden, but it's meant, I think it's over five years. So it's something mm -hmm. like 400 billion a year. 
that's just, and it's all going to be, most of it's going to be horizontal and some of it's going to be residential, whatever. It's not like it's all going into office buildings in, in downtown Manhattan, but the point is, no. it's going to pull a lot of steel workers away and it's going to pull a lot of cement and it's going to pull, you know what I mean? Like yep. the labor shortage, especially in, in some, um, uh, some trades is going to be pretty acute. So no matter what, we're going to have to figure this out. And, and to, to Sal's point, it could be that when you, you have that kind of a trust need, you'll pay more for it and you get the people that are good. And when it's a simpler job or mm -hmm. lots of it's done in, in, a, in a fabricating, uh, off, you know, offsite fabricating, maybe that, I don't know. It's, it's some way or another, something's going to give. Very true. Well, one thing I think we can do to help out with that is really is more of the software. And so let's talk about that. You know, the question I had up here to kind of spur some thoughts is what is holding your team back from using more software? Specifically, how can your team leverage more software this year? And there's uh, several sections in the book here where you start talking about it. But let, let's start. Let's start off with basics. How we define software, and you pull this from Wikipedia: computer software, or simply software, is a collection of data or computer instructions that tell the computer how to work. Pretty simple, right? Of it's the instructions telling the machine what you want it to do. Is that how you would define it? Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's software is such a big word. I, that's why I grabbed it from Wikipedia because it's just, this is so big a definition. It could mean honestly anything. In, in fact, this mean, this would cover the, the, you know, the 1950s when you had, you know, punch cards. Um, and, and, you know, I don't, hopefully I'm not getting ahead of us here, but the reason why it was important to think about what software is so that you can think about what it's good at and what it's not mm -hmm. good at. All it is is instructions that somebody thought to write that will it, that it'll go do. So if you push the right button, it does this. And if you push mm -hmm. another sequence of buttons, it does that. And that's important because it, it means, on the other hand, it means it remembers everything you tell it ever, and it understands absolutely none of it. It can put nothing, <laughs> nothing you've told it, nothing you've shown it. Does it have any idea what it means? It doesn't, there's no such thing as meaning to any kind of software, and that includes AI. Oh, yeah. Well, that goes back to the phrase we've all probably heard, garbage in, garbage out. I mean, it's going to do what it was programmed to do and what you told it to do. It's uh, We're in that brave new world of it thinking of what to do through machine learning and AI. And even there, we're at such basic levels. But I get fascinated still when you look at, uh, for example, smartvid.io you know, what they're doing and they named that th their engine Vinny and what Vinny has done in three to four years of crawling photos, looking for all those safety violations is fascinating, but that's still a lot of programming behind what is happening there. So. Well, one thing I'd say though, is Vinny doesn't know what is or isn't safe. Vinny is right. just able to recognize things that in the past you said are not safe. Correct. So, Strict so parameters. Well, but yeah, that's right. But also only in that net, like, so great example, I, I may even use in the book, I think I do. You know, this, this one computer was able to, not computer, this one set of algorithms was able to beat the world um, champion in Go, right? And everyone freaked out. Oh my God. In fact, this is the Sputnik moment for the Chinese AI industry. I don't know if you've ever heard that before, but because it's, mm. it's a Chinese game and they were like, no one's ever going to win. And then they did like a decade before anybody thought they would. The point is, if you turn around and say, okay, I think it's uh, AlphaGo. Okay, AlphaGo, can you do my taxes? Nothing. Hey, AlphaGo, you know, what, what's the weather out? Nothing. The point I'm making is this thing is absolutely superhuman in this narrow little thing because they showed it millions and millions of games and then taught it to train itself and all that. But it's, it has no idea about whether it's good or bad to win a game. Mm -hmm. It has no idea about why it wants to win it, none of that stuff. And that's important when we think about software because it does stuff that can work human but there's mm -hmm. nothing under it. It's just it's just a set of instructions or it's a set of patterns. That's what AI is really more about patterns. But so it, the reason I thought defining it made sense is it sets the it sets the start to be able to say, well, okay, if I'm going to use software and I'm going to ask my team to start using it, it's important that we all know what it is. And mm -hmm. all it is, as I say, it's a set of data and instructions, and that's it. So think about it like any other, and that really is a machine. A machine has fuel and materials and it has structure. I mean, it's a bit of a, mm -hmm. it's not a stretch, but the way I'm speaking of it kind of is. So if you think about it, you wouldn't expect the mach any other machine or any other tool you use to do more than it was designed for and software is identical. So, so you, if you understand what it's designed for and more importantly, you make the people who are selling it to you 
explain how it was designed and, and how they got there. Right. Then you know you can make a smart decision that you know what I don't need this machine today, or yep, you okay. know what we do need this machine because I'm tired of having Freddie over there do all the all the daily reports. Very true. Well, that leads us to talking about this. Why do we use software? You know, there's three things that I pulled from the book. Uh, first, it's to reduce human error because humans make mistakes. You you could literally read the wrong word, you could write down the wrong letter, the wrong number. It does increase our work capacity. You know, computing power arguably is faster than the human brain of trying to add numbers together or keep track of multiple things, even develop at the, at the highest level. I think what you're trying to express in the book is developing these data sets yeah. that you can analyze and look for trends that are much faster than arguably writing them down, putting them in a spreadsheet. It makes things easier for the human, right? I think you're right. And, and this is why I, I got it. I started with that. The talk to, you know, a moment ago was talking about how software remembers everything. We don't, we, we know what things mean, but because we know what things mean, we remember things in a really lumpy way. So we remember mm -hmm. bad stuff, we remember good stuff, but we don't, we're not really good at, at, at giving you an average. So if I said, hey, Rob, how many, you know, what's, what's your average time to work? Of course, today that's 30 seconds from, you know, <laughs> the, from the, the den to the bed, better. But, but it, you know, if you tried to remember things like that and you were and tried to, you would give a bad average because the average mm -hmm. would be the last couple of days or whatever. So what software is able to do, especially, you know, things like project management software, wink, wink, is able to look at how projects have run over time and give you a much more accurate idea of what happened. And more importantly, keep in mind lots more details. You know what I mean? So the human errors are, mm -hmm. are everything from entering stuff wrong, but often it's just, we don't really have a great memory for averages and for long kind of stretches of time, you remember the, the spiky bits, the parts that were really good or bad. Um, so I think that, that, that gets you to, you know, you can handle more stuff. You can, I mean, there's a great book, by the way, um, called The Second Digital Turn. And a guy named Mario Carpo was talking about how in, the, in, a, a, uh, in medieval Italy, when they started using a certain kind of, of drawings, they were able to make more complex buildings. And it, he used it, it's the beginning of the book. So it kind of, he goes on to other stuff, but his point was they started using paper to handle complexity better. And it meant that they could handle more. And this is a really good analogy. That's why he, he brings it up is that's what software allows us to now do is a PM can handle more complexity because he doesn't have to hold it all in his, in his head or in a notebook mm -hmm. is, is, you know, PM, whether it's PM software or it's, you know, BIM coordinate, all these different things allow you to hang on to more data and more details than you ever could or a group of people ever could. Very true. Very true. And specifically when we talk about it in the construction space, we talk about estimating workflows, accounting workflows, project management workflows. And we've already touched on the BIM side. Software is what makes all of this work so much better, faster, and to the point of understanding what is your historical data of how have you performed you know, if you're creating multiple estimates every year, are you feeding back real world data to true those up every time? You know, accounting is real interesting looking at what, how a general contractor versus a construction manager versus a trade contractor runs that said set of books. But uh, lots of different software out there that can help out. Now, you broke down really into three parts when we're talking about software. You talked about the data part, the instruction part, and the hardware part. Can you kind of elaborate a little bit on those three? Yeah. Um, so you think about data is the, 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 the content. It's the stuff that, that you, you grab from wherever you're grabbing it because you're entering it or it's coming from a sensor or it's coming from other people, whatever. And it's important to keep that separate because you know what, what you put in is garbage, garbage, garbage in, garbage out is, is half the problem. Is how well are you putting data in? And that really drives a lot of the value you're going to get. Um, a great example that, that you have know, talked about in the past is there's a company in, in uh, Mid-Atlantic who they spent about 18 months working with their PMs to have all the data put in the same way. And as a result, and because it, it just took that long, nobody was going to stop in the middle of a job and you know how that stuff goes. Mm -hmm. So by, by, by about 18 months in, everyone was putting in data the, the same way. And all of a sudden they could look at each, every job the same way and compare them against each other. So you're doing real-time benchmarking. And what happened is senior management could say, all right, we need these, this, this job's in trouble. Send people there and, and make sure that they can have all the resources they need and, and you know, this job's doing you know, really well or whatever. 
So when you think about data, a lot of what you gotta think about is that that is the job of the user to do a good job a lot of times, is to, to you know be careful about how data is going in. Instructions are the software. So that's what what software are we choosing to use and, and how how are we using it? Um, and then the, the you know that's where an eSub comes in is are we choosing not only are we are we understanding what eSub built, but also are we understanding why they built it and is there stuff in there that we don't know about? Because a lot of times some other company will have worked with eSub and so you know what we really need is we need this to be able to you know do bot, do pie graphs, and you didn't know that was there. So understanding that what what's built is often and that's what you know most companies have it like eSub I'm sure does have customer success folks who are really good at this. Mm -hmm. um, understanding what, what the four corners of the software are, because it's usually more than you, you think it is there. Uh, and then, you know, hardware is just, this, this is where everything's moving in a lumpy way, but pretty, still pretty darn quick. And it's worth knowing that, uh, that there's been a lot of progress in data in terms of how we deal with it. Big data is, there's more under the hood with big data than we sometimes think. Um, and the you know, software is obviously getting better and better, but hardware is the thing that moves the fastest. That when you hear about Moore's law, you know, the, the number of, of, of transistors doubles every, they used to be 18 months and everybody forgot that and now it's every two years, but that's okay. Um, that's still happening. Believe it or not, it's, it's every, 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 they keep saying, oh man, the laws of physics and this and that, and you know what I mean? And, and it, they still are able to. So, and, and that's, that's insanity. If, you, if, you're, if your money, so the, the example I give in the book is, if you double a piece of paper, just fold it in half on itself and then fold that in half, and then fold that in half. So you're going two, four, eight, 16, 32. The number of times it takes for you to reach the moon, if you assume it's a, I forgot what it was, like a half a millimeter, it's like 40 folds. It's, it's, it's a crazy thought experiment that I read about a bunch of years ago is that the compounding effect of just doubling things is insanity. So the first, as an example, the first uh, microchips had, I don't know, 100 or so, I don't, I don't even know the number, but it doesn't matter. Some, some really small number of trans, transistors that could barely do anything. Now we're routinely putting, you know, billions and billions and billions on a, on a microchip and the complexity of the chips is insanity. So the point I'm making is hardware keeps moving and it's, it's not gonna stop. Once, once they can't do the, uh, the doubling of, of transistors, they're gonna make them 3D, which they've already started to do and find other things that effectively means hardware isn't even close to, to being done, getting better. And that makes everything else faster, cheaper and easier to use. So I think the intelligence you're gonna have on your glasses in the next two years is gonna be crazy. Very Just as a, as a simple example. I mean, my watch is a supercomputer, which is crazy to think about. Um, you know, then, and when Apple comes out, they're, they're apparently, you know, looking at something this fall to, I don't know, to tease or something, but uh, it's, it's going to be, it'll be a pretty amazing. They always come out with something that really makes you think twice without a doubt. Now we had a few topics that we were going to run through today, just to kind of cover some things in the book. So the first one is, you know, what is software good at? And specifically we're talking about construction but also what is software, you know, not so good at? So let's kind of dive into this first one. Hugh, I'm curious to get your, your feedback. So let's go with the not uh, to start off, right? Of Well, one, it cannot read your mind. And two, it's pretty bad at following instructions, in particular, bad instructions. Uh, what else would you put out there that software is not good at? Uh, filling in the gaps. So one of the things that, that software has taught us a lot about is how incredible the human mind is. So mm -hmm. we all go nuts at, oh, look, the computer can do math really fast. Well, you know what? Okay, then what? What humans are good at is, is I, can, I can say, Rob, I need to do this and give you like half the instructions that are needed and you're gonna fill in the gaps. Mm -hmm. You're gonna say, well, he's, you know, he probably means this and, and you're probably gonna be either right or close enough that we're fine. Software doesn't just, if two things. One is it won't even fill in the gaps. It'll just stop. It just won't work. It, right. won't, it won't even get it wrong. It just won't work. So, so that's kind of related to these two is software is not good at filling in gaps and we are built to fill in gaps. I mean, a lot of um, uh, optical illusions are about filling in gaps. Like you've seen those little angles, those little elbows that, that mm -hmm. turn into a triangle. That's what our minds do. And, and so when we try to make software do stuff, we realize that, oh my God, the human brain is so good at filling in gaps and seeing seeing subtle patterns. AI is getting there, but it's still nowhere near as good as we are. Mm. Uh, so that's, that's a big one is, is it's not good at, at understanding 
anything about context so it can't fill in any gaps because that's why you're able to fill in gaps you can ask your question you, you can ask yourself questions about me you're like all right well in the past i know hugh tended to be late or he tended to be whatever so that's probably what's going on now you know what i mean whereas software has no no ability to think like that true and then if you think about what is it good at now a few things i pulled from the book well first you know it's digitizing information you know in, in our case in our industry from paper it makes things definitely a lot easier to find right you know that that call out detail on a buried sheet of plans fill in the blank there are so many things that you can find easier and faster but again i keep bringing up analyzing data for performance trends software is really good at that or at least at a high level let's think about at the executive level of it, you're collecting data you're creating dashboards for executives to consume easy now, Hugh, that was one thing we talked about before of just the visual way human brains work. What do you think? What is software good at? So I think what these three here kind of ladder up to data, right? So it's making making information on paper into data. It's making you able to find that information in that data and then ladder, you know, analyzing it and finding patterns. I think that's one big bucket. So so mm -hmm. it, it's a data and information. Another bucket you just spoke to is software now allows us to access information and, and well, really information in new ways. So, so that, you know, the power of a 3D model to, to tell you what I mean, you know, like there's nothing like it. If I'm a designer and I want to describe something and I can put you in it as a, you know, in VR or just even just on a flat screen, you understand it in a way that you never could from something flat or from me telling you about it. Mm -hmm. So I think that, that, that's, you know, we're seeing software be able to create and, and show people things in some seriously powerful ways. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's a really big one. I guess the final one is, is not only software, but software is at the heart of it, is, is related to data, but now much more about data from everywhere. So really situational awareness in a, in a, in a, with a kind of a density that we couldn't do any other way. You, if you look at, um, manufacturing supply chains, um, especially for more, you know, more expensive things, it's incredible what they know. Like they know everything about where stuff is, what, you know, whether it's delayed, they know where the boat is, the whole thing. And I think you're, I know you're going to see that with construction. It's starting in the EPC world because again, the, the value of certain things is just high. There's more money involved in, in certain parts of it. But you're seeing, com you're seeing companies do things with um, sensors and with tags and with this you know, tape and various other things. So I think software allows you to, to represent a process with a level of, of detail you never could do any other way. So, so it, it's not far from now where a PM will be able to look at a 3D model and then be able to look at the supply chain feeding into it like ants going back into an mm -hmm. ant and kind of say, all right, here's the, the red zones I'm worried about. Okay, let's get on the phone with that supplier you know, blah, 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 all that, and really understand in a visual way what's going on. You know, you point out the visual thing also, sorry, I'm rambling here, but the largest part of our brain is a visual cortex. We're better at seeing things than any other way of understanding them. Very true. Very true. Now let's dive a little bit deeper. We're talking about specifically, you know, the construction software side of well, what is PM software good at? And a lot of what you're talking about was the hours previously wasted looking for information. So the first thing it does, it reduces that uncertainty and it improves your productivity. It gives you process improvement. The, the fourth I've thought is a very interesting statement, single source of truth. I've he heard this used by a few software vendors and I think it's a very, it's a, that, that one's a little odd because the single source of truth, everyone has a single source of truth, right? Every GC, every construction manager, every trade. Hugh, how easy is it for those three? And let's think, well, let's think back. If we're talking about the owner to the design team, to the general contractor, the trade contractor, and those four groups, is it possible to have those four circles with a center pin that really is the quote, single source of truth on a project that everyone agrees on in 2021? That is such an awesome question because it's a difference between theory and reality, right? Like the, the hmm. theory is, yeah, the theory is you can have it all in one place because you, you require one person to approve it for it to be 
the, the, the real source of truth. The reality in a fast moving job site with, team, with more than one team <clears throat> is it can be more complex than that. The mm -hmm. point of PM software is you have no hope of one of a single source of truth except that way. You mm -hmm. see what I mean? Yeah. Like you're, there's definitely, you know, you know, over in one part of the job, somebody has a, an RFI that, they, that they've decided to do something about or they got back or whatever it might be. And that's changing the drawing. And it has nothing to do with somebody, you know, on the other side of the job that's doing something else. And maybe they have something that's changing as well. And you can have potentially, well, not potentially, probably almost always, multiple sources of change uh, uh, happening to the, the quote unquote source of truth mm -hmm. at their own pace and, and, you know, kind of not really aware of it. The, but the, I guess the point is, in theory, there should be one, one source of truth that you can go look at. The reality of it is it's more complex than that. And, and that's a little bit up to the rules that the, the uh, that are established on the job site. But the other side of it is you have no hope of single source of truth without something like PM software. If it's ever gonna happen, it's gonna happen because there's software coordinating teams that otherwise wouldn't talk to each other. Very true. Very true. Now let's talk about topic number two, because this is where it gets very interesting. You're describing kind of how the side of the table that we're on, on the software side, you know, how is software created? And arguably there's two main, two main ways. And it's very fascinating. You draw the analogies of how similar construction honestly is to creating software that there's these two methods. Uh, previously, we always heard about the waterfall method versus this new agile approach. And there's kind of some similarities in building methodology. I'm curious, can you dive a little deeper of, you know, what, why was there this transition from the traditional waterfall method to where we hear so much now about agile in building our software? Yeah, and what's interesting is, is the, the waterfall versus agile thing it shows up in a lot of different places. So I've spent some time in the advertising world where you had creatives go off and they were not that different from trade specialist. You had someone who's really good at art. You had someone in the art could be another person who's really good at film and so on and so forth. Um, the waterfall, the idea there is somebody goes and does a study. They do a market, re a market requirements document, an MRD. And they say, basically, here's what we, what the market needs. We need to have these functions. We need to have them work more or less like this. And then you can have that turn into a, 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 a PRD, which is a product, believe it, I've honestly never used one before, <laughs> just funny. But basically you're saying, okay, what is that tech, what is that gonna turn into? What's the, what's the brief? And the point of the waterfall method is you basically specify everything. You get really detailed, you think everything through. It's, it's very valuable for that reason that you, you think everything through and you specify everything and then you hand it to the software team and they go away. You have meetings once in a while. How's it going? It's going good, but you know you don't really see any software until they come back with something that's more or less finished. Hmm. And this is the way everything is way the way lots of projects were delivered, whether it was software or other things. And the problem with that idea is two things: really solving problems means that you discover things that make you need to go a little bit left or a little bit right, and and you you, you wind up in places that that you couldn't know when you were doing the original plan. That sounds a little bit like an RFI process. It's not a, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, yep. and, and the same, some of the same things are going on too, is that the, the original specified, the original designer of the software wants to design as little as possible for as much money as possible, which again, if that sounds like someone we know, it's, it's, mm. it's very, it's just reality. You know, people want to get paid as much as they can for as, in as, as often as they can. And that means delivering as little as possible. So what wound up being true is because you end up really far away, uh, and there was no real RFI method in software. Like it just, they went off and did it. Like they did, when they didn't know, they just wrote, they said, well, I'm smart. I, you know, I went to MIT, I'm going to figure it out. Which is a problem with software development generally is you, you need to be careful that the team is coming back to you because they're, they're problem solvers too. And if you imagine if there were no RFI process, what a building would look like. <laughs> Every trade would solve problem. They would solve the damn problem, and they get the building up. But it might not look anything like what they originally wanted it to because there's right. really slower ceilings and things going straight through the floor. I mean, right. you're kidding. But so anyway, the the, the point is, in, in about 20 years ago, a, a bunch of senior and uh, software developers said, "Look, I'm tired of having to redo everything. I'm tired of pissed off clients and so on. We need to say." I want to tie together the process of building to the people that know how it's going to be used much more tightly. 
So Agile has a bunch of parts to it. Um, some of them are about the team reflecting on how they work, so kind of more internal. The biggest thing that matters is you, you build, there's 12 points to the Agile Manifesto. If anyone's curious, it, honestly, it's a single page. Um, so it, it, it's, it's more about laying out a philosophy than it is specific methods, which I'm, I love that you call it the Agile approach instead of a method. Um, so hopefully I did that in the book. <laughs> but the idea of Agile is that you're showing real working software to your customer as early as you can. And the way, so there's all sorts of analogies. One of them is before you build the Maserati, you know, piece by piece, build a, build a um, what's it called? Build a skateboard. So it still works. A skateboard does what a Maserati does. It will get you from point A to point B, mm -hmm. you know, on wheels. But it's, you know, it's bare, as bare bones as you can possibly get because then people get to play with it. Because the other thing that is true is that in abstract, people don't know what they want as well as they do when something's in their hands. Mm -hmm. So the other thing about Agile is to get working software in customers' hands as soon as possible so they can say, well, actually, I thought I wanted a button here, but I really want a button there. And, and you do that iteratively, but the, 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 the kind of pattern you usually do is the product manager meets with the dev team once a day and something they call a stand-up. And the idea of a stand-up is you're not gonna sit down, smoke a cigar and chat. You're, you're literally standing up and you're saying, here's what I did yesterday, here's what I'm doing today, off you go. So it allows the product, the, the manager of the process to have just a really under, good understanding of what's going on, make sure people are going the right way and people need resources, all that stuff. But every two weeks, they meet with the customer who can get their hands on working software as early as possible. Because again, it's like a prototype. And in a prototype, you, you, you just experience it better and differently. So those are the two big differences. One is you go, you go super deep and hope you got it right. And the other one is you still need to go deep. One of the problems with Agile, by the way, is it can make people a little lazy and they don't do enough upfront thinking. A professional won't do that, but I've seen a lot of people do that, where they, they basically say, screw it, off we go. You know, let's build it. The other problem with Agile is it tends to be, it, it tends to be a problem solving approach, not a delivery approach. Mm. So when your teams are running Agile, someone needs to say, yes, but we're shipping on this date, right? Because coders will sit there and code for the rest of their lives because that's why they're doing what they're doing. So oh, yeah. Anyway. Oh, yeah. Well, we've got a few minutes left. Let's talk about a couple other of these points and we'll have time for maybe a question at the end. So topic three is how do I make sense of all of these apps that are out there? Because the last time I checked, Hugh, I heard a number or something last year around 3,400 apps in the worldwide marketplace. And how do you evaluate those needs, right? I came up with these three things from reading through the chapter in the book of the first one is what is it for? And then you have to ask yourself, why do you need it? Because one of my good friends in the business, uh, Benjamin Crosby over at Yates, has a great quote of, hey, cool's not a business plan. And you, we see a lot of cool tech that you're like, wow, look what that does. And I've seen them go out of business, unfortunately. Uh, so you got to ask yourself, what's it for? Why do you need it? And what does it do for your team? What else would you guide somebody when they're trying to look through the app store? They see all these awesome videos on YouTube or LinkedIn. Like, how do you evaluate and wade through all the apps coming at you right now? Yeah, I, I, these, these lists are good lists. Is uh, First thing is there aren't that many. It, it, yeah, there's 3,500 because there's a bunch of, you know, folks that throw stuff up. I don't even know 35, whatever. If you, are, if you narrow it down to what you're looking for, even the, the, you know, some of the, some of the categories that are the, the most crowded have like 40. I mean, that sounds like a lot, but then you can immediately eliminate half of them because they're small or they don't have what you need more than half, most of them. So sure. the real number of software types or, or, or offerings that, that are, you know, do what you want is usually a lot smaller than you think it is. Um, so that's kind of point one is it feels like a lot because construction is, is, is huge and, and, if you're going to put, you know, BIM software, you're going to put Revit alongside eSub, your, your category is too wide. <laughs> right. You know, and that's true about everything. Like if you right. can say the same thing about cars, oh my God, there's hundreds of cars. Well, yeah, but you know what? I, I want an American car. I want a sedan. And, it's, and even you know? so, so it's not that crazy. That would be point one. The next thing I would do is, is think about the, the maturity of the company. That, that narrows it down enormously. But also think about the maturity of the, of the technology being used. 
Um, mm -hmm. Some of the stuff that gets thrown around is still a little new and a little demo-y. It's really, really, somebody smart said it. Demos are trivial. Um, execution, the real software is hard. And that's right. It's, it's not that hard to do a demo and make something look good. Um, it still takes work, but it's not that hard. What sucks is the other 95% of making software. Because getting a demo <laughs> up, you know, you can do in a hackathon. Uh, you know, it'll oh, still yeah. Oh, yeah. Easy. But getting, a, getting working software that has, you know, a, a, a service level agreement that has all that, all that stuff, that matters. You know, and I don't, I don't want to be crapping on, on startups. I'll probably be one again my, one day. But it's worth keeping in mind the maturity of the, of the company and how much they're saying they can do. And, and more importantly, are, are the, does the software currently do what you need? Don't ever rely on a roadmap. Oh, yeah. Well, that leads me to the next point. Let's talk about for a sec. You know, how do you select that software? I've been talking about my eight steps for since 2013. You came up with these four steps that I think are a really good point for people to begin with, right? It's first to find the problem you're trying to solve, you know, because we've seen this with marketing. You can see a lot of software looking for a problem. Right? Yeah. Yeah. But do you really have a problem? I mean, one that I always like to bring up in construction circles is time cards. I fundamentally understand from the industry that there is a problem with collecting time and getting employees paid because I was a safety director that on Fridays, guess what Rob used to get to do before 12 p.m. Yeah, every yeah. Friday? Yeah. It wasn't do safety inspections. Hey, Rob, are you busy? Yeah, Take yeah. these checks out right now. Because uh, we had a problem. We couldn't collect time accurately and pay the people. So we looked for a solution, right? But then to your point, getting that demo, demos are awesome if they're live and they're real. But more importantly, I think what you're getting to is don't just show me the demo. I want to use it. And, you know, the term we use in the software side of the business is in a sandbox and then rolling it out. You know, what have you seen effective from the companies that you interviewed of how do you get software purchased and use it? So there's a, it, what's cool about the, the, the world we're in now is that none of this is new. So lots of GCs and everybody is, is getting good at this. And, the, and if you're not good at it yet, there's a lot you can learn without working too hard, like from stories and blog posts and all this other stuff. So, so the, the point is, there's a few things. One is, is um, you know, the sandbox means that you've isolated it from things that can hurt. <laughs> That's the point. Mm -hmm. So if you're not hooked into systems that it can screw up or, you know, it, you've either got, you've got it redundant or something like that. Um, so what, what I've, a couple of things. One is um, give it more time because people are busy and I hear over and over again that three months sounds great until it's month two and a half, at which point I haven't, people haven't even looked at it yet. So, so definitely right. imagine it's going to be six months. But the other thing that's important is the, the sales and customer success are so linked in, in an in a, uh, industry like construction where it is, once you've made a sale, you've only made your first in, inroad, right? Like you've sold mm -hmm. the innovation team, you've sold to like one project that they, 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 they're, personally nursing and good you know a couple of, of, of contractors i've heard of have internal teams that will then create an uh, essentially training for new software if it makes it through their testing and they like it, it then they'll go and set up um, training so that it'll get adopted by other groups scans mm -hmm. going to be this i've forgotten if they still are but they were where they had a team that was and it's an awesome idea it's like we we believe in this as a company we know that our local PMs have, not local, but our, our project PMs have a lot of autonomy. So I, we need to convince them and tell them that not only is this something that Skanska believes in or, you know, Kiwit or DPR, whoever, but also that here's what you need to know. Because the hard part about, about new software is no matter how easy it is, you're changing something. So either the customer success group at the software company, which is where it probably needs to start, and or the internal group at the at the, you know, the the contractor has to say, all right, I'm going to package this up and make it so they can really easily weave it in without without disrupting what they're doing, because nobody's going to say, all right, everybody, I need you to stop for an hour, you know, or stop right. for day and figure this out, because it's like, well, are you kidding me? So the rollout is a big deal, and and that's that's the hard part. Is it's more about it's less about tech, and it's more about imagining somebody working this into their workflow as painlessly as possible. I hear you. We've got a couple minutes left. Let's wrap up a couple of talk points here. 
because we covered some of this. That way we can leave a little bit of time for some questions. So the last topic we had was what should I require from a software company before deciding to do business with them? And five of the things that I pulled out from the book is something to definitely think about, right? And the first one is, you know, rever- review the terms of service, or you might have heard the term thrown around EULA, user license agreement. It gets real interesting what some platforms say they can and will do with your data, but then look at the pricing options. Do they want to sell it to you per person, per seat, transferable licenses per month, per year? Do you get references? Now, this is an interesting one, Hugh, of asking for current references or past users. Then it gets really nerdy, right? Data integrations. If we're talking about a time tracking app, that's a lot of questions versus a safety app versus a photo app. And then the last part you brought up a couple of times, help implementing that software. Do they have a good, we, we call them CS or CSM, customer support. Basically, who after you've purchased said software helps you, who trains your ninjas to train more ninjas of how to use that software? These were five I pulled from the book that I thought were fascinating that you've seen. Any thoughts on these uh, points to look through? Yeah, I mean, pricing is up to you and the, the terms of use is you know, up to you. I mean, it, should be, it shouldn't be stupid. Um, they're gonna, you know, and if they're gonna grab data and, and use it to train models, just you know, make sure they're anonymizing it, which they'll do. The references can be hard because it, references often wind up being generic because you know, DPR is not calling up Kiwit and saying, hey, how would it go? And in fact, one of the crazy things that, that, that you see in the industry is people think off the shelf software is, is a competitive advantage. It's just, it's a knee jerk. And I, right. I run into it a lot, but you know, if you can get like do a, a press release, people will often do that because they want to they want to show how um, mm-hmm. how innovative they are. Data integrations, I, there's a couple things there. One of them is how do you get data in? Is that relevant to the software? That it may not be, but also are, how are they integrating out? So for a lot of smaller mm-hmm. stuff, knowing it works with Procore or CMIC, who are a little harder to work with, but they're they're getting there. Um, or does it work with eSub, for example? Mm-hmm. Um, you know that matters because you, you're probably not buying software that does everything, right? You're, you're buying software right. that does a thing, and and you're already somebody else is running your job site for you, whether it's right. eSub or something else. So knowing that that um, it's able to integrate or work with is is could, could be important, and it may not be, but it True. could. Be. True. And, yeah, and the health thing is a big deal. It really is. It it they, they, it should be easy, and it's. It's already going to be a pain in the neck. Anything you can do, anything that they're, you're getting the sense from them that they're set up to be empathetic and, and, uh, and you know, be there for you. That's right. All right. Well, man, this has been an amazing amount of information. We went really fast. I know we did some Q&A up at the front. So let me just put up a couple things so everybody has some contact information and some other resources real quick. So thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. We hope that you enjoyed these little uh, tech nuggets from Hugh's book, and these tips will help you out. If you want to check it out, again, we have been talking about content from Hugh's book, The Construction Technology Handbook. This is the URL where you can find more about it. Go to hughseaton.com forward slash book forward slash. And also, this is his email address if you want to reach out to him about the work that he is currently doing and just find out a little bit more about what's going on. You can also check out his podcast. It is called Constructed Futures with Hugh Seaton. And he puts out, you do two shows per week, correct you? That's right. Good deal. So check that out where you find your podcast. And you can also check out the show that we run over here at ESUB. It's called Power to the Trades. We focus on a show every Friday. It's a 20, 25 minute interview with either a customer, a construction user, an industry influencer, somebody that we're always talking about basically how to add more power to the trade contractors. And I'll leave you with this. Uh, If you're curious about software specifically for trade contractors, and well, that's what eSub does. We are the only 100% trade focused subcontractor platform out there, arguably. So four things we do. We are field focused on project management through our great mobile app. We really help you out on your document control to kind of, when we're talking about that single source of truth, well, this is where you put all of your projects across all the owners and the GCs and the CMs that you work for. We have a very interesting way to show you labor productivity and really try and help with protecting your profit. So if you're curious and like to set up a demo, please reach out to me directly or go on to esub.com and you can make that request. So I know we ran a couple minutes over, but thank you so much for everyone today. Hugh, thank you for your time. Thank you for the book and the information. Anything you'd like to leave us with, sir? 
no, this has been an honor. Thanks again, Rob. Absolutely. Well, we'll be back uh, in May. I believe that date was around the 15th. So stay tuned. We should be sending out some e email information. We will come back with a third part of this series and then figure out probably a couple podcast crossovers. Everybody stay healthy and well out there. Hugh, talk to you next time, sir. Thanks again. Thank you. We'll see you, everybody.